Chapter 9 of Bushido, The Soul of Japan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Awaii in December 2009. Bushido, The Soul of Japan by Inazo Nitobe. Chapter 9 The Duty of Loyalty. Of the causes in comparison with which no life was too dear to sacrifice was the duty of loyalty, which was the keystone making feudal virtues a symmetrical arch. Other virtues feudal morality shares in common with other systems of ethics, with other classes of people, but this virtue, homage and fealty to a superior, is its distinctive feature. I am aware that personal fidelity is a moral adhesion existing among all sorts and conditions of men, a gang of pickpockets or allegiance to a fagin, but it is only in the code of chivalrous honor that loyalty assumes paramount importance. In spite of Hegel's criticism that the fidelity of feudal vassals, being an obligation to an individual and not to a commonwealth, is a bond established on totally unjust principles. A great compatriot of his made it his boast that personal loyalty was a German virtue. Bismarck had good reason to do so, not because the Treue he boasts of was the monopoly of his fatherland or of any single nation or race, but because this favored fruit of chivalry lingers latest among the people where feudalism has lasted longest. In America, where everybody is as good as anybody else, and, as the Irishman added, better too, such exalted ideas of loyalty as we feel for our sovereign may be deemed excellent within certain bounds, but preposterous as encouraged among us. Montesquieu complained long ago that right on one side of the Pyrenees was wrong on the other, and the recent Dreyfus trial proved the truth of his remark save that the Pyrenees were not the sole boundary beyond which French justice finds no accord. Similarly, loyalty as we conceive it may find few admirers elsewhere, not because our conception is wrong, but because it is, I am afraid, forgotten, and also because we carry it to a degree not reached in any other country. Griffiths was quite right in stating in Religions of Japan that whereas in China Confucian ethics made obedience to parents the primary human duty, in Japan precedence was given to loyalty. At the risk of shocking some of my good readers, I will relate of one who could endure to follow a fallen lord, and who thus, as Shakespeare assures, earned a place see the story. The story is of one of the purest characters in our history, Michizane, who, falling a victim to jealousy and calumny, is exiled from the capital. Not content with this, his unrelenting enemies are now bent upon the extinction of his family. Strict search for his son, not yet grown, reveals the fact of his being secreted in a village school kept by one Genzo, a former vassal of Michizane. When orders are dispatched to the schoolmaster to deliver the head of the juvenile offender on a certain day, his first idea is to find a suitable substitute for it. He ponders over his school list, scrutinizes with careful eyes all the boys as they stroll into the classroom, but none among the children born of the soil bears the least resemblance to his protégé. His despair, however, is but for a moment, for, behold, a new scholar is announced, a comely boy of the same age as his master's son, escorted by a mother of noble mien. No less conscious of the resemblance between infant lord and infant retainer were the mother and the boy himself. In the privacy of home, both had laid themselves upon the altar, the one his life, the other her heart, yet without sign to the outer world. Unwitting of what had passed between them, it is the teacher from whom comes the suggestion. Here, then, is the scapegoat. The rest of the narrative may be briefly told, on the day appointed arrives the officer commissioned to identify and receive the head of the youth. Will he be deceived by the false head? The poor Genzo's hand is on the hilt of the sword, ready to strike a blow either at the man or at himself, should the examination defeat his scheme. The officer takes up the gruesome object before him, goes calmly over each feature, and in a deliberate, business-like tone, pronounces it genuine. 
That evening in a lonely home awaits the mother we saw in the school. Does she know the fate of her child? It is not for his return that she watches with eagerness for the opening of the wicket. Her father-in-law has been for a long time a recipient of Michizane's bounties, but since his banishment, circumstances have forced her husband to follow the service of the enemy of his family's benefactor. He himself could not be untrue to his own cruel master, but his son could serve the cause of the grandsire's lord. As one acquainted with the exile's family, it was he who had been entrusted with the task of identifying the boy's head. Now the days, yeah, the life's hard work is done. He returns home, and as he crosses its threshold, he accosts his wife, saying, Rejoice, my wife! Our darling son has proved of service to his lord. What an atrocious story! I hear my readers exclaim. Parents deliberately sacrificing their own innocent child to save the life of another man's. But this child was a conscious and willing victim. It is a story of vicarious death, as significant as, and not more revolting than, the story of Abraham's intended sacrifice of Isaac. In both cases, it was obedience to the call of duty, utter submission to the command of a higher voice, whether given by a visible or an invisible angel, or heard by an outward or an inward ear. But I abstain from preaching. The individualism of the West, which recognizes separate interests for father and son, husband and wife, necessarily brings into strong relief the duties owed by one to the other, but Bushido held that the interest of the family and of the members thereof is intact, one and inseparable. This interest it bound up with affection, natural, instinctive, irresistible. Hence, if we die for one we love with natural love, which animals themselves possess, what is that? For if ye love them that love you, what reward have ye? Do not even the publicans the same? In his great history, Sanyo relates in touching language the hard struggle of Shigemori concerning his father's rebellious conduct. If I be loyal, my father must be undone. If I obey my father, my duty to my sovereign must go amiss. Poor Shigemori! We see him afterward praying with all his soul that kind heaven may visit him with death, that he may be released from this world where it is hard for purity and righteousness to dwell. Many a Shigemori has his heart torn by the conflict between duty and affection. Indeed, neither Shakespeare nor the Old Testament itself contains an adequate rendering of Ko, our conception of filial piety. And yet, in such conflicts Bushido never wavered in its choice of loyalty. Women, too, encouraged their offspring to sacrifice all for the king. Ever as resolute as widow Winetam and her illustrious consort, the samurai matron stood ready to give up her boys for the cause of loyalty. Since Bushido, like Aristotle and some modern sociologists, conceived the state as antedating the individual, the latter being born into the former as part and parcel thereof, he must live and die for it, or for the incumbent of its legitimate authority. Readers of Crito will remember the argument with which Socrates represents the laws of the city as pleading with him on the subject of his escape. Among others, he makes them, the laws, or the state, say, Since you were begotten and nurtured and educated under us, dare you once to say you are not our offspring and servant, you and your fathers before you. These are words which do not impress us as anything extraordinary for the same thing has long been on the lips of Bushido, with this modification that the laws and the state were represented with us by a personal being. Loyalty is an ethical outcome of this political theory. I am not entirely ignorant of Mr. Spencer's view according to which political obedience, loyalty, is accredited with only a transitional function. It may be so. Sufficient unto the day is the virtue thereof we may complacently repeat it, especially as we believe that day to be a long space of time, during which, so our national anthem says, tiny pebbles grow into mighty rocks draped with moss. 
we may remember at this juncture that even among so democratic a people as the english the sentiment of personal fidelity to a man and his posterity which their germanic ancestors felt for their chiefs has as monsieur Boutmy recently said only passed more or less into their profound loyalty to the race and blood of their princes as evidenced in their extraordinary attachment to the dynasty political subordination mr spencer predicts will give place to loyalty to the dictates of conscience suppose his induction is realized will loyalty and its concomitant instinct of reverence disappear forever we transfer our allegiance from one master to another without being unfaithful to either from being subjects of a ruler that wields the temporal sceptre we become servants of the monarch who sits enthroned in the penetralia of our heart a few years ago a very stupid controversy started by the misguided disciples of spencer made havoc among the reading class of japan in their zeal to uphold the claim of the throne to undivided loyalty they charged christians with treasonable propensities in that they avow fidelity to their lord and master they arrayed forth sophistical arguments without the wit of sophists and scholastic tortuosities minus the niceties of the schoolmen little did they know that we can in a sense serve two masters without holding to the one or despising the other rendering unto caesar the things that are caesar's and unto god the things that are god's did not socrates all the while he unflinchingly refused to concede one iota of loyalty to his demon obey with equal fidelity and equanimity the command of his earthly master the state his conscience he followed alive his country he served dying alack the day when a state grows so powerful as to demand of its citizens the dictates of their conscience bushido did not require us to make our conscience the slave of any lord or king thomas mowbray was a veritable spokesman for us when he said myself i throw dread sovereign at thy foot my life thou shalt command but not my shame the one my duty owes but my fair name despite of death that lives upon my grave to dark dishonour's use thou shalt not have a man who sacrificed his own conscience to the capricious will or freak or fancy of a sovereign was accorded a low place in the estimate of the precepts such an one was despised as nei shin a cringeling who makes court by unscrupulous fawning or as cho shin a favorite who steals his master's affections by means of servile compliance these two species of subjects corresponding exactly to those which iago describes the one a duteous and knee-crooking knave doting on his own obsequious bondage wearing out his time much like his master's ass the other trimmed in forms and visages of duty keeping yet his heart attending on himself when a subject differed from his master the loyal path for him to pursue was to use every available means to persuade him of his error as kent did to king lear failing in this let the master deal with him as he wills in cases of this kind it was quite the usual course for the samurai to make the last appeal to the intelligence and conscience of his lord by demonstrating the sincerity of his words with the shedding of his own blood End of chapter nine